Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. Today, we're having a chat with Charlie Lane, who is a singer-songwriter based in Melbourne. Her latest album, I'm Okay Now But I Wasn't, is out now and you can listen to it on Spotify. In this episode, we talk to Charlie about her journey in the music industry, the reason for why she writes the way she does, and how it has helped her better deal with her mental health and emotions in general. She's also someone who lives with a disability, so we discuss some challenges she faced growing up and how they led her to the path she's currently on. This was a really insightful conversation about disability, music, and creativity in general, which you definitely don't want to miss. So without further ado, here's the episode. Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. Um, today we have a very special guest, Charlie Lane. Uh, she's a songwriter and singer. Um, Charlie, do you want to quickly introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Charlie Lane. As you said, um, I'm a singer songwriter from Melbourne um, in Victoria, and I am yeah about to release my album, so that's very exciting. But yeah, it's lovely to be here. So thanks. And what's the name of your album? Yeah, the name of my album's "I'm Okay Now, But I Wasn't," which is a little bit ironic, but it's <laughs> um, yeah. But I will let. You- yeah, we'll go on with the, the thing and we'll, yeah. No, I, I really love that name. I just want to say it because it just shows that, it just shows a journey in like one sentence. Like you weren't okay before, but you worked through your problems and you're better now. So I just I just love that. Thank you. From, yeah, well, I mean, I wanted to be brutally honest from the title. I didn't want to, you know, go over anything. I'm, I'm not a very subtle person and also I'm pretty honest in my lyrics and I wanted to just say it from the get-go what it was like you know so Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what the album's really about anyway so yeah thanks yeah tell us tell us a little bit about your music journey and how you got started well I started when I was about 16 a little bit before I mean I always wanted to I, I shouldn't say I always wanted to do music but from then about so that's when I really kind of started writing lyrics and writing poetry but um from then on I kind of went to JMC Academy which is a music school here um and then from then on um I kind of created Charlie Lane and worked with session musicians um put out a few EPs and singles and then then came the the album so yeah I guess that's a little bit about my music journey, yeah. Right. So was it 16 when you realized that, yes, that's something that I would I would love doing? I mean, I always kind of knew, like, I, I loved music. Or, like, right. I, I came from, like, a pretty broken home. So my dad always listened to, like, blues and soul and um he's like a Catholic man. So he would always, like, it would we wouldn't actually be allowed to listen to, like, pop or anything in the rain on in the um in the household or in the in the car and then when I went to my mum's it would be like top 40 and kind of like yeah kind of folky ladies but yeah and then so it would always be around me but then it was kind of that age where I was like this is something I'm like really I really want to do as a career so it was Mm. it was an interesting experience music for me growing up but it was yeah it was definitely that age yeah yeah and what was your first album about and what was that process like because you know creating an album for the first time um you're probably just starting out the um so like the first ep that i created yeah yeah, the first ep sorry um the oh gosh that was a while ago (laughs) (laughs) um Oh, it was interesting. Like you definitely live and learn from your mistakes, but in terms of like production and writing, but I've also, it, it was such a different genre too. Like I had trumpets in there and I had uh, just so many different session musicians playing and um yeah, lyrically and even like vocally, I did things so different from then and now which is, I'm just like reminiscing now because it was such a long time ago. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was it was really fun, those EPs but and even singles, but 
I definitely like this album a lot more, I would say. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've grown older, yeah. wiser, you know, stronger. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it's more like the, yeah. And I think stuff going on like mentally for me back then, it's just like, I feel mature. <laughs> I think that happens, you know, happens. you make something yeah. the first time and then you learn from the mistakes um, and then you make something better the next time. It's always a journey of improvement. Yeah, because because I listened to some of the uh, music from your old, like I was just checking out your Spotify. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, the music that I think that sounded a lot more country. I'm, I'm not like a huge, um, I don't know a lot about music, but I think that sounded a lot like country and now it's more pop, maybe. I don't know. Um, so it's, the, yeah, it's definitely a different ginger, vibe. Maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the new single, yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, I do go a bit of a like <laughs> genre bouncing around uh, like Junior is more of a singer songwriter contemporary song mm. like it's not I guess I put out Gold Drips first which was my first single which was very like heavily like indie rock vibes and then it kind of like progressed down to Ginger which is now very slow and gentle mm. and I wasn't sure about releasing it because I was like wow it's a lot different to what I put out mm. so glad you like it so thank you um, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's interesting what people like and what they don't like but mm. in the end I just kind of want to be authentic so yeah but I reckon it's quite quite common right for artists to to change their their genre um throughout their journey I think it's it's quite common as well for me what I like to think is you're not really an artist if you're not really exploring I think so. Like, it depends. I think some artists do and then some artists don't. It just depends how they feel about their work. But yeah. I think across the years I've definitely seen artists do it. And, like, right. sometimes I think when you narrow yourself into your genre so much, it's like, mm. you know, it, yeah. is it going to be boring for the listener or is it going to, like, where can you, you can't really expand much, like, yeah artistically i don't know that's just my opinion though no i totally so, agree with it um yeah because even like if i imagine myself being an artist right i think i would like to master one genre and then try something different if i'm if i'm doing the same thing again and again i, I would assume it would get boring and i think it's also kind of what, what we did with the podcast and um, because earlier we were um interviewing a lot of tech people startup people but then we're like okay you know we also have other aspects of our lives. Like I really love the arts and um, theaters community. So we decided like for this month, we would start interviewing, um, you know, people from other, other areas of life as well, because we just love talking to them. And it's definitely been a great experience, you know? So, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. No, it's, it's good that you've like reached out to different, I've, I, I watched little bits of people on your podcast and it was good seeing like just different people from different areas. It was really cool. Yeah. 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 When you were first starting out, did you ever doubt yourself, um, you know, as a singer? And if so, how did you overcome that initial doubt? Oh, so much. I still doubt myself. It's <laughs> hard. Okay. Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> doubt is like, I mean, especially when you're first starting out, there's so much competition in the industry as well. And there's, especially personally with having disability, I mean, it's really hard you're already like in a very competitive industry and then having that layer of like, you know, a disability as well, you're com you're already like jumping hoops and barriers in life and then you're mm -hmm. doing it in the music industry. It's it's very hard. So you're always down, you're like in the back of your head like, oh, should I just, should I just give up sometimes? And then, uh, but, you know, you've always got that little bit. So even now, of course, I still have it, but I've also come to like understand that it's also a unique thing about me. So who cares what other people think or, and also like it's competitive industry, but you've got to not compare yourself to other people as well. Otherwise you're going to like completely just do your head in. For you, how do you measure its success when you release an album? Um, uh, let's say, or um, an episode, uh, not an episode, sorry, an EP. I don't know why EP is <laughs> such an okay. episode. Yeah. There's so many um, different, like, 
acronyms for everything. So yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, oh, it's such a hard one, success, isn't it? Like, especially with music, because there's so, oh, I don't even know. I don't, I really, success is a hard one to measure with music and with mm. like releasing. Like the album's coming out this Friday, and I have no idea. Honestly, I'm like, <laughs> how am I going to measure that success? I don't know. Yeah. It like, yeah. do you measure it by how many people like it, or how you feel about it? I I don't know. Like, mm. I just want to put out something that I feel proud of, and then in the end, if I think I've done a good job, if like, if I have done what I think is a good enough job, at the end of the day, I think that's enough. Mm. I think, yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do I get your <laughs> approval at least? No, no, no. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I think <laughs> for me, the way I measure success is like um, to make sure I'm always improving. Um, so if you know, if I, if if I say like the last for you, I would say if the last album um, uh, does better than I mean, if this album does better than the last one, in your personal opinion, I think then that's a success. Um, or if you try something new and you're learning something new, I think you can always find success. Because, um, yeah, as long as you're producing stuff, um, even if you're not maybe reaching the audience you want or having the impact you want, I think you're always learning. And that in itself is a great achievement. Yeah. I think so. That's a really good way to measure it. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this new album. Um, what inspired you to get started on it? Um, this new album, wow. It's a, I mean, inspirations came, I mean, the title does say a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm okay now, I wasn't. Um, although, uh, it, like, it, it is, does interweave, like, my disabilities and my childhood. That's a lot of my album. Um, coming mm -hmm. from, like, a broken home and I do talk, or well, not talk, I sing, um, about my, um my family a lot and my relationships and my life it's, it is pretty much about my life but mm -hmm. it is I guess a big reflection of like my past mental health um ability and track sorry um it's called I can't do much and that track is really the biggest reflection of going like okay look this happened and honestly, you can't really do much about it. So I'm just going to sit back and literally enjoy the view because mm. at the end of the day, like, you really can't do anything about the past but reflect and move on. So, yeah, it's it's a pretty reflective album for me personally, but I also had to write those songs because if you don't write about or don't get out the past, it's, it can become, well, they, you can't keep it and, like, let it stay in you. Like, you mm -hmm. have to really, as a songwriter, especially, especially, that's our, like, outlet. It, it really is. It's like, yeah, you have to get it out somehow. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, there, there's definitely a lot I agree with, um, like, especially with writing um, as an outlet because um, I sometimes write a bit of poetry and it's just, it helps me better deal with my mental health, better deal with my emotions. And I think once I've written it down on paper, I feel like I can let it go and move on. Um, I don't know if you find it similar. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And then and the other thing, I've been, I've been thinking of this analogy, right, lately. Um, and you mentioned I can't do much, right? Um, I don't know if we're going to put this in the podcast, but um, I just want to say it because uh, I've been thinking a lot <laughs> about this. Um, imagine you're a surfer, right? Um, and you're riding a wave. So the wave is going to take you where it wants, so you don't have much control, right? But you can maybe tweak a little bit here and there um, and kind of work with the wave to go where you want to go. You can fight the wave, but that's not going to help. Um, and I feel like that's what life is like. You have a general direction where you're going, which you can't really control. Um, and if you try to fight it, you're going to get defeated. But if you tweak and make use of the things that you have at your disposal, then you'll be able to head in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. <That's good>. yeah. <laughs> it's a long one, but it's a good yeah. one. I like it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. It's, 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 it's a long one. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Good. I like it. Um, so this this album, um, this album of yours, I'm o I'm okay now, but I wasn't. Um, it all started off with just you kind of reflecting on on your life. It, is that right? So it was quite interesting. I I wrote some of it when I was like the kind of the more positive songs or I actually I'll go back. I wrote a lot of them in like the darker periods. So I wrote most of them when I was actually in that dark mental state. Right. Um, yeah. But then when we actually started recording the process um, in the studio and maybe one or two of the tracks, the like more positive-ish songs, um, was when I was kind of like, I'm actually really good now. And I just knew, though, that like we need to record these songs and they're really important to me still. Mm -hmm. And I'd already written them too. So I was like, no, these need to get like put down and released yeah. and mastered um, and mixed. So, yeah, it was an interesting like way to write and record and everything because I was like, oh, I, I, that's when you have doubt too because you're like, oh, do I put these out? Do I hmm. not show the world these really, really vulnerable songs because, like, they're almost not a part of me anymore but they still really are because, I mean, they're there hmm. and they really were a big part of my life. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. And is there a message you're trying to send through this album to your listeners? Um, I guess, like, that it's okay to not be okay really is, like, the very short message is that, like, and if it's someone can relate to any of that, that, that that's mm. great. Um, yeah, because they are quite dark songs, but... Um, so, I mean, be prepared. <laughs> they are quite dark songs. Yeah. But um, they, I think it's, yeah, if if that's one message, it's just like it's completely, I, and I know some people will relate to these songs. Mm. But, um, yeah, it's it was a tough time. And so I hope that if anything people get out of this is just that, like, there is a, it's so cliche and tacky to say it, but the, the, there's a there's a brighter light at the end of the tunnel or whatever that saying is, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, there's a light at the end can, of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, like you can, there is, yeah, there's a definite yeah. way yeah. through a dark time, yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, tell, us, tell us about the song Ginger. Who is that about? Ginger. Ginger's an interesting one. So I wrote, that was one that I, one of my first songs at about 16, um, about like a boyfriend at the time and he was mm. a ginger. Yeah. It sounds so like, uh, <laughs> yeah. but um, it really was a, uh, I wasn't going to release it and definitely not where it was at, at 16 years old. I was not going to do anything with it. Yeah. But, um, my stepdad passed away during COVID and I was really close to him and he mm. was ginger and it was his oh. favorite track. So we um we bought it back. Like I was in a gospel like, like a choir-ish thing. And my singing teacher was the lead singer, uh, the lead the director. Mm -hmm. And so she um got the whole choir together and was like, we need to put them on the track. So they all came into the studio um and sung on the track on the bridge and oh. i just wanted to recreate the bridge section to show like the grief that like i was going through when i lost my stepdad and it was his favorite track so i was like no we have to put this on the album mm. um and then yeah so i put the choir and i put um what else was on the oh the violin so i wanted to get like the violins and this big build that you probably heard in that big bridge section with the choir and yeah, so I just wanted to make it a little bit more pretty and nice for him, I guess. Yeah, it's a little bit of a an ode to my stepdad. Yeah. Yeah, that's really sweet. Um, like first it was about your boyfriend, yeah. but then it became about your yeah. dad. 
and kind of the evolution of the song yeah yeah i always find that like i oh not always but like i do find that i end up writing about one thing and it ends up being about something <laughs> completely different yeah. and that's exactly the same as ginger it it happens but yeah it's an interesting one i'm also <clears throat> also just wondering what your creative process is like does it just come randomly do, do your inspirations just randomly pop up and then you just jot it down i guess or you you sing it or... yeah, yeah you're right it's very random like it'll right i'm always like in the shower and i'm like thanks head like yeah why now and then i'll have to like jump out and quickly grab my phone and, like quickly do a voice memo of a melody yeah, or something yeah. or it'll that's like now but pre <laughs> pre to my my whatever I do in this house. Um, when I was writing this song, it would I was in a share house, so I was always like yeah. going into the garage and I had my keyboard and force yourself to come up with ideas or something. Well, yeah, and it was also mm. lockdown, so mm -hmm. I had yeah. the yeah, it was really difficult. So I was co-writing with my guitarist who who co-wrote the album. His name's Adam Heath, and. We were kind of like sending voice memos to and from each other. We were like, does this sound okay? <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah. yeah, does this sound okay? And I was like, well, it was That's really funny. difficult, but also, yeah, it was funny because it was just like, how do we write this album without seeing each other? <laughs> and yeah. then there was those little gaps where we were like allowed to see each other. Mm. Um, so we just like quickly ran over and tried to record and then, some, and then lockdown finally finished and then we could finally lay down the whole demo, which was so good. It was like... It was the thing good. with Melbourne, though, was that lockdown's never really finished. It was, it was <laughs> always just like always a long coming break. back. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard for me to remember, like, was it was it the lockdown finished? Who had COVID? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's I remember one time Adam did have COVID and then we couldn't re rehearse or record yeah. and then it was like, Wait, was that lockdown? <laughs> I, like, it's all, it's I'm all, all just that, like, yeah, yeah it's just yeah. like, as long as it doesn't go back there, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sick. It's funny because I think before the podcast, me and Tom were just talking, we're trying to figure out when, when, when a squid game come out. Was it before COVID or after COVID? And it, yeah, it's just, <laughs> yeah, memory is all messed up. Yeah, it did, like, really, I think it's messed a lot of our memory up. Hmm. Hmm. But yeah, now that lockdown is hopefully over for good, um, do you have any favorite places you like to go to either write or record or just come up with, you know, creative ideas? Um, creative ideas. I always go to, I don't know if you know, the NGV gallery. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes, like, because I draw a little bit as well, and I go there and I just, like, sit down and, like, look around and draw. Mm. But... I also just find it gives me a little bit of inspiration. Mm. Sometimes I record it at Head Gap Studios and I find that place like just amazing to just go to. I actually recorded Ginger there. We like did the film clip there as well, which was really cool. Um, and I don't know, Rick, I haven't really had time to like sit down and actually write a lot at the moment because I've been doing a lot of the PR and all the management and stuff to getting this album out yeah but yeah yeah so it's it's been a bit hectic but mm -hmm. once this is out i'll be like slowing down a little bit i think and going back to the writing process so mm. that's interesting yeah yeah i, I want to know a bit more about like the whole management aspect of it like you know there's obviously the songwriting and producing aspect which we kind of talked about but what's the release process like what what kind of steps do you have to take to yeah, get out there. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Give us like a summary. So like I guess depends if you're releasing like a single or an album or an EP, but um I get, with an album, I honestly just had no idea how much effort it would take, especially when you're an independent artist. Mm -hmm. When you the especially the financial aspect, it's so much money um goes into an album and recording as well so I mean when you have the recording process you're putting money into the studio fees into your especially as a solo artist mm -hmm. 
putting money into the session fees, um, the recording fees, and then you come out going, okay, I've got this mastered album and it's pretty and I can release it. Then you go, hang on, I have to market this album now. (laughs) Because as a singer, a songwriter and musician, you you now have to become a content creator, mm, exactly. marketer, an advertiser, yeah. a touring artist, or you're planning to be a touring artist. And it's overwhelming the amount of work that mm. is involved that people just don't know. They just kind of see this, oh, like whatever's on social. So it's yeah. like, oh, you are now on tour or you are yeah. playing a gig and that's all you are to them. So it's amazing the amount of work that's in a release it's kind of like you have a PR company that kind of like does all the press um and that's how you pay them to do the press or um yeah it's I can't even think right now how much is like I've had to do because it's I've put out four singles and then you put out your album or however many singles but single by single you you know you put out a video clip with that as well and it's a lot it's just so much work and yeah I music never videos or something like that as well right surely there'll be music videos or stuff like that too yeah that's, that's <laughs> right yeah exactly please correct me if i'm wrong but wouldn't it be simpler um signing with a label because doesn't the label that you sign with usually do most of the tedious work so yeah that's the thing so i guess doing it independently you have a lot more freedom to do kind of like what you want when you want or that but also financially it's more of a struggle however saying that there's record companies also take i don't know the percentage rates how much they take off the artist Mm. and they might pay for it up front like like help the artist financially up front but then being in debt to a record company is insane and yeah. the amount you have to pay back afterwards like is it yeah worth it contract before signing because so many independent artists and very small artists don't know much about copyright and publishing or the music business side of things and mm-hmm. luckily I studied that was part of my um uni degree so yeah. I'm very lucky but a lot of artists up and coming I feel sorry for because they just don't know and they're like oh my gosh an indie label that I've never ever heard of before and no one else has either but they're so <laughs> excited to be like you know you got picked so they yeah. end up signing a contract and then they go oh my gosh like no yeah. I mean, debt for the rest of my life. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, uh, and independent is maybe better choice. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like, if you sign with a label, like, does the label own your music, or do you own your music? You know. Um. There's different kind of deals, but usually, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. Um. Okay. There's different. Yeah. There's. It's very complex, yeah, but yeah. definitely different type of recording deals you can get. So in terms of ownership of your music, I mean, you should always own your music. Mm-hmm. Don't let a record company <laughs> own your music that is bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not a good yeah. idea. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's what happened with um, Taylor Swift a while ago, right? Um, when I'm not sure if you're you're aware of it, Charlie. But then I'm not a Swifty, but like I'm a I'm a uh, yeah. I like it definitely. Yeah, I'm yeah. not a Swifty yeah. either, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there was this whole thing going on that she had like a falling out with her record label. Turns out that they, um, um, I don't know if that's completely accurate, but then um, they took a lot of a lot, like a lot of what is hers. They just kept it for themselves, as in like the money that the songs were making, and that's mm-hmm. why she came up with Taylor's version because now when you search up on Spotify, there'll be like the old version and then does the newer Taylor's version. Oh, um, that's why there's a separate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Oh, that and makes, that's, yeah. That's, and that's cool. just because, that's yeah. And that's just because um, the record label screwed her up 
before um, and she wasn't making the money that she was supposed to make and stuff like that. So yeah. there's all of that happening, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that, super interesting. Cool. Yeah, so <laughs> I, 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 I totally it's get it. a way of doing it, though. Yeah. That's very clever. Um, for your performances, so like, wh- when are you performing around Melbourne and are you touring Australia? Where, where are you going? Yeah, so I've got a tour at the end of this year. It's just a little mini mini regional one, but we're going, album launches the 15th of November um, at the Cactus Lounge in Thornbury. And then we've got the 17th, we've got Castle, Maine, the Shed Shakers, Shed Shakers to Brewery in, um, I always forget the name of that place. Yeah, so 17th. Um, Shed Cheekers Brewery in Castle, Maine. We've got two shows there. And then after that, we've got December 1st in Footscray. So it's like right down the road. It's called Mama Chen's. That place mm-hmm. is cool. And then on the 6th of December, um, I think we're waiting on that one, but we've, that's going to be a really cool show. And I think it's at Bakehouse Studios in Richmond. Um, but yeah, we've got a few cool shows coming up, which is going to be really good. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have a pre-performance ritual that you like to do before actually going on stage? Oh, like when I actually get there, I just everyone just leave me alone, really. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's my my performance ritual is just like go to the green room, have some like sensory or desensitize, and just like because I, I like to just know my lyrics. I have so many of them, um, and I just need to like keep going over them keep going over them because and my my session musicians always know this they're like okay just leave her alone (laughs) but that's it's not really a ritual it's more so like something I need for me because when you have sensory overload and people coming up to you like wanting a chat and going like hey how are you and you're like you just, just get overwhelmed. <laughs> just it's really alone, overwhelming, so. like yeah. going, doing a gig. Yeah, especially doing yeah. a launch because you're prepared for so long. Yeah. And it's like, especially doing an album launch, like you've done the whole album and the whole prep and then you, you go into your launch and you're like, you've got, you know, a few people there. Everyone wants to talk to you, obviously. Mm-hmm. You just kind of want to talk to them after. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just after because you need that time just to, want to get every, especially i'm a pretty perfection like i've got that perfectionist in me mm. and I'm, i need to get this right <laughs> so, yeah it's um it's a thing but i think it's also a lot of artists have it so they just want to get the show done get it done correctly the way they've planned it yeah then yeah, yeah. okay um i went to like a songwriting workshop as we were talking earlier and I, I just couldn't remember the lyrics, even though I'd written them like two minutes ago. Um, and I kept forgetting the flow of, of the song. Um, but maybe that's because I'm a rookie. But has that ever happened to you during a performance? You either forget the flow or the lyrics? Oh, yeah. Like, constantly. <laughs> like, it, <laughs> How do you it, deal with that? Well, I mean, it's mostly anxiety. Like, performance anxiety happens to so many singers and so many performers. Um, like I actually used to take medication for it because I was, I was just so overly anxious on stage. That was one of the first things I noticed being a performer studying. We had to do, it was a bachelor in performance, music and performance. And the first year I couldn't do the performing. I was so overwhelmed by like everyone watching me and I just couldn't Mm. do it. But I mean, I could but I lost every lyric like on stage. I, I got on and I was like, I know this. My brain just couldn't connect with yeah. my mouth. It was just, well, um, now I'm so comfortable. I think maybe because they're my own songs and my own words, my own feelings, but I still lose track sometimes. And I don't know if it's cognitive overload or anxiety or the combination or disability, my other disability is going like, just no, like, <laughs> I don't know. But it's really interesting, isn't it? Just like losing train of thought in your lyrics. And yeah. it's one of the most like vulnerable, like gross feelings ever. Like I just, yeah, I hate it. But it happens and you just move on. 
Yeah, your brain decides to give up on you at the wrong times, that's why. Yeah, it, it definitely does. <laughs> do you have any, like, uh, like creative blocks? Like, do you ever get any creative blocks when you're writing um, or, like, producing music? And how do you, how do you deal with those? those? Creative blocks? Um, yeah, I definitely, I found this year, like, I thought I'd be... I don't know if it's a creative block or whether I just thought I'd be writing more whilst doing the album, like uh, like putting the album out. Mm-hmm. But this year I'm kind of like maybe because I'm in a new headspace now, I'm kind of like, oh, am I just not getting it as much as I used to be? I'm not sure. Um, but the ways I've gotten out of it is just connecting with new people that are different songwriters with me and um getting their perspective like just getting new perspectives as well and um also going to songwriting workshops like you just said like it's that's one of the easiest ways to do it really um and also going out and just the way I remember how I used to get my inspirations which is like sometimes just going out having a day of just like walking around and sometimes I just need to do that to just mm. have a walk around and write stuff down or yeah. hear the even just do voice memos all day that's how yeah speaking and speaking of inspirations do you have uh, do you have um, any inspirations in the music industry as in do you have any artists that you look up to there's so many <laughs> like it's right. a really good question because mm-hmm. i because i do like like so many genres it's quite yeah. hard to go I like this one person, um, but um, like obviously, Addy, the person who introduced you to me was Eliza Hull, and she's been a great mentor this year. And as a disability advocate, but also as a musician as well, she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, mm-hmm. So she's absolutely amazing um, as an Australian artist, and yeah, she's been a huge inspiration. Ugh, inspiration. <laughs> Need water. Um, but um, there's so many good Australian artists too. There's, I guess, as an indie artist, that would be her. And then um, there'd be, oh, gosh, there's some overseas. Like I'm a very much, I like a lot of Brit pop and Brit punk as well. So I like like Kate Nash and like Lily Allen and, Oh, I liked Amy Winehouse. She's not around anymore, but she was a huge inspiration, just that, like, really raspy voice and um, producers like Mark Bronson, like, people like that as well, but they're huge inspirations. Um, yeah. yeah, punk band called Am on the Sniffers, Amy, um, yeah, she's really cool. Um, but, yeah, there's just huge, huge inspirations, yeah. If you could collaborate with any artist, like, either dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, well, I'd probably have to say Amy Winehouse. Like, House. Her, she's just so cool. Like, I think because she's got that really raspy voice and she can sing, like, her pitch and control is just ridiculous. But she also collaborated with Mark Ronson, who is a really cool producer. And he also, he collaborated with her on Valerie. And, mm-hmm. um, Everything that I've heard of her, so and like her Back to Black album was just amazing. And I just think she's just a phenomenal artist. And I think everyone does. Like, you know, no matter what genre you like, she was just so cool. Um, but yeah, I think she's really, really, I would have just loved to like write with her even or just like meet her and go, like, can I pick your brain? I mean, I know she had a lot of issues, but like, yeah. don't we all? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I really liked her songs too when I was younger, and then I was quite quite saddened by the fact that she passed because of yeah. it was really unfortunate as well, right? She died because of old overdose, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Super yeah. sad, but yeah. Yeah, sad story. It's definitely mm-hmm. a sad story, but yeah, her voice though. Oh man, that was cool. I haven't listened to her, but I think I, I'll be checking her out after. <laughs> after the you haven't listened to anyone else ever? Oh, wow. Really. Oh, go. Yeah, I don't you. know. 
<laughs> Where have you been living? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, really cool, like jazzy, yeah. husky voice. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess for the for the final question of this section, I would also like to ask what keeps you motivated and what keeps you going. Oh, like so many things, but I, mm. like just like the love of music is honestly, it's always there no matter how many financial barriers are put in place and how tired I am or how fatigued I am every day. It's kind of like I still work up and go like I need to do music I can't not like I and also I don't know what else to do with myself like <laughs> I, I do have a side job but at the same time it's like I, there, there's nothing else I know how to do like I just mm. I yeah that, that's pretty much it yeah it's either this or nothing right yeah, yeah it's that's exactly right that's and you try to tell people that aren't in the industry or like you can try and tell my parents that they, they don't necessarily agree, but it's, it's something that you can't really explain. Sometimes it's, it's this or nothing. And sometimes, it, yeah, it's just not a choice or something. Yeah. Even, yeah. Yeah. I just want to ask one more question. Uh, what would you say is the hardest part of being like an independent artist in you know today's world? And how do you deal with that? Um, one of the hardest things, especially for up and coming artists, is just like the oversaturation of the industry. So mm -hmm. it's just so much music at the moment coming out. And yeah. it's like to be seen or to be recognized, it's just really, it's really tough um, to break through in industry. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And also just like the financial barriers of absolutely everything paying for, you're literally at the moment, you're paying yourself like, to to be in the industry you're literally paying your way you, you just have to it's part of it you're paying for pr your managers mm. booking agents i don't know about other countries but it's a tough one financially yeah definitely yeah anyway i think um we're going to go to the next section and maybe talk a little bit about your disability as well um so do you quickly want to tell us a little bit about your disability and what impacts it had you while growing up? Yeah, sure. So um, I've got cerebral palsy, which is like it's left side hemiplegia. So I've got it very quite minor, but it's in my left side. Um, I've also got recently, whilst I have this album, I end up with POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is very hard to explain, but it's why I'm very fatigued and um it came on from long COVID so mm. um it's um not been a fun one especially while you're releasing an album because it can mm. come from stress as well so when you're like high stress levels and then you're all of a sudden like fatigued and like it's just not great but in terms of CP when I was growing up I think I mean it's going to impact your childhood no matter I mean, if you don't want it to, it, like, it doesn't matter. It's going to. Um, it impacted also my family as well. Like, they had to take me to hospital appointments and, um, yeah, I had to have physiotherapy and occupational therapy and um, splits on my legs and splits on my arms. And I think the biggest part that it, that it affected was, you know, when you're growing up, kids can be really cruel and they, they don't mean mm. to be sometimes, yeah. but um in primary school and things kids are just really curious and they're just asking questions and eventually you know it starts affecting your mental health because and sometimes people like I know can disconnect the two between like mental health and and physical disability mm -hmm. but the two actually kind of internet connect because the I guess not from having a disability, but because of the barriers put in place mm. from society, you know, like because having a physical disability, there's so many like accessibility barriers put in place and then stigmas put in place from society. And then you kind of just like left in the dark a little bit as a physically disabled person. And then it creates mm -hmm. anxiety and PTSD and all these things. And 
you just kind of yeah so growing up was just really quite tough um but especially in that in those younger years where like primary school was hell for me I didn't expect it to be I thought that would have been a breeze and then high school would have been like oh like a little bit hard but high school was actually quite easy and it was the primary school where I developed quite strong anxiety and like the pressure was real because the kids mm. were quite cruel and I was like oh okay then yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. as you said, yeah, kids can be quite, they, they, they don't know what they're, they're saying. And it obviously can really hurt exactly. someone else's feelings. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, I was also really like, curious while you were, you were talking about your disability, whether it ever impacted your music in any sort of way. True. Yeah. The, I mean, it, um, in the music industry, there's not much, there wasn't, especially earlier, there was never much space for disability in the music industry. And it's gotten better because there's so many disability advocates now, especially people like Eliza Hall. And I'm trying to make space for younger people as well. And um, there's other, other people as well. <clears throat> but um, it's really great to see now. But there has been a lot of barriers and hoops and things to jump through, like, you know, getting on stages and people also think that I don't have a disability because mine's quite invisible. And when people think that you're, you're not disabled, but you are, you really have to advocate for yourself. Mm. And that can be quite hard because, you know, being assertive, I mean, it's, it's quite hard being assertive going like, excuse me, no, um I have yeah. a disability <laughs> like you don't want to have to say it all the time and yeah. it becomes like proof uh, but what is it burden of proof where you're just like I'm so tired of repeating myself all the time but at the same time it's really good to say it because then people can understand more and you can give them knowledge but mm. it can get tiring and I can in the music industry, it does get really tiring having to go, okay, I'm disabled. <laughs> but um, yeah. especially, like, because people think that I'm just not. Um, mm. And with this new chronic illness too, it's completely internal. You can't see it. Um, it's the one, probably more than cerebral palsy, that's the one thing that's going to affect me on stage because I get really thirsty and my heart rate fluctuates so i'm like <laughs> like just very heavily breathing um mm -hmm. so it's going to be interesting to see on tour how how i go fatigue wise um mm. but yeah it's a good question that's a relevant question too yeah totally and i want to talk a bit about your mental health how how do you deal with the stresses that cause them to on your mental health and have you you know like you lived with it for a while now. Have you developed any, you know, good routines that help you have a more positive mindset about things? Yeah. So yeah, I have lived with mental health for a while now. Um, I've definitely the the routines that I do, it like literally just get out of the house every day because you need to like if especially if it's stress related or like I, I live with PTSD and so I literally just have to remember I. I've gone to a lot of therapy, so I know what I need to do if, like, circumstances get a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I, I have a good therapist, and um, but I do get out of the house and I just make sure I go on, like, de-stress walks and <laughs> um, have good – I just have really good supports around me as well, mm -hmm. um, which is just super important for mental health. Like, you need good friendships and you need – and my family are really good too. Like they have been so good for me, like during those really dark periods as well, um, which has been really nice to have. And I know people don't have that. So, um, yeah, it's been good. Yeah, really good. That's great. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like I, I think during COVID especially, I, I would just play music in my headphones and then just go on a walk. And, yeah, because... No one was allowed to go outside. Like you weren't allowed to leave your house. 
And I feel like that just helped me so much, you know, deal with mental stress um, of university, of just life in general. So I definitely can relate to that. Yeah, and I didn't even mention music. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put music on when I go for walks, and I put my vinyls on when I um come home. But mm. it's literally like my vinyl player is my savior when I need to de stress. I will put my lamp on, turn off all the lights in here, and just turn like put all the vinyls on that I own. It's mm. such a de stress in music. And it's so important to our lives. Yeah. So that's another reason why it's just like another coping mechanism, not a coping mechanism, uh, a, co a coping, um, what do you call it? A, something to help you cope. But yeah. I don't know the word I was going to use, but <laughs> there you go. That's okay. Um, yeah. yeah. I, have, I have one last yeah. question. Um, like, do you, how often do you listen to your own music? And do you like ever go back? It's like, ah, oh, this this sounds so bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> just overanalyze it's, it. It's such a good question. I have to listen to my music, especially this album, so many times now because you have to like put it up on so many different platforms and make sure it's all correct to send out to different people um, for PR and uh, publications and just into my session musicians and it, I've listened to it so many times like repetitively that it's almost gotten annoying and I'm yeah, like yeah why don't like this anymore oh my god yeah. um yeah so <laughs> um I have overanalyzed it a lot now because now I'm like did I really want to put out that single hmm. should I put out this single um at the end of the day, you can't do anything. It's mastered, yeah. it's mixed. And that's yeah. another thing, you know, even during the mixing and mastering process, I was like, I must have annoyed the heck out of my mixing engineer because I was like, oh, can you just change? Can you just be a perfectionist too? It's like, can you just add the violin? Can you just turn up a little bit? Can you just turn the choir up just a yeah. little bit? Yeah. Can you take my backing vocals out? Like, it's hard, but you just got to stop at the end of the day and just go, leave it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yes i have definitely gotten sick of my own songs that's for sure yeah definitely yeah. Okay. well we've been going on for quite a while already um yeah. so let's let's move on to our closing section um sure. so during during this this month during the artist month we like to ask all of the artists what does art mean to them so what does art mean to you what is art? Is in music or like just, art in a general? Just, just any anything. Uh, it's, just about anything. It's a, art is such a broad spectrum, but um, art. I mean, art means everything to me, though, because like even you know, painting, drawing, music, everything. Because I mean, what is a world without it? Like it's it's for me, it's quite boring. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I don't know what I do. I I draw a lot too, and. I just, it, I'm a very big creative and I just don't know what I'd do without art and I don't know what I'd do without, say, the NGV gallery. I like it, it would be a very interesting and I think pretty boring world without it. So, yeah. Mm. It's like a world without colour, just black and white. Yeah. It's, it's really, like, what would you guys do without art? Oh, um... Yeah, it's, I, I get bored really easily. So I'll just be like, just trying to figure out what to do with my life. Because, you know, you need time to like de-stress. Like if I didn't have music, I would just go crazy, honestly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Same with me. Yeah, yeah, same here. It's just going to be so boring. Every day will be so boring. <laughs> yeah, what just, it, right? yeah. yeah. How would I de-stress? I'm wondering. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you could go to nature. I think that would help. I could just Nature's shower. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just like, have, yeah, infinite showers. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then what, is there like any particular piece of art that has had a significant on you on or on like the way you deal with life? Wow, that's, a, that's such a hard question. Like one piece of art. One. Oh, that's so hard. Um, 
that's too hard. I can't, not one. There's so many, because di- there's so many different types of art. And I, I mean, there's a singer songwriter called Daniel Johnston, and he had like a profound impact on me just because of the way he writes. He's, he's dead now, but he's also got um, a movie called The Devil and Daniel Johnston. And he was, he suffered schizophrenia and had a lot of, I think he suffered more than just schizophrenia. He was quite mentally ill, but um, his songwriting was like very important, I feel. And his, his, and he also, he actually did drew as well. Um, but I feel like his art was, it's kind of like a, he, he had like a little bit of a cult following, but I feel mm-hmm. like his artwork and his art was really important. And yeah. So, what was his name? Sorry, Daniel Johns. Uh, Daniel Johnston. Sorry, not Daniel, Daniel Johns. Johnston. Not from Silverchair. Okay. A different yeah. Daniel Johns. Johnston. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was a right like a mus- musician singer. Yeah, he was a musician, a singer songwriter. Okay. But wow. yeah, you've got to kind of listen to his lyrics because his playing was like not in time, and it was quite all over the place but I'd recommend watching his the movie called The Devil and Daniel Johnston because it really shows more about his growing up his childhood and like Mm. why he was the way he was and why he wrote the way he wrote and a lot of people have done covers of his songs um because they found he was just quite a unique character which I found quite interesting yeah 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 that's great um and lastly, like we we love to read, both Tong and I. Um, do you have any book recommendations for us and our listeners? Oh yeah. Um, well, I, I saw that question actually when you sent it to me and I really liked it. Um, do you guys know Monkey Grip? That was like my favorite book. It's a penguin classic. I don't know if you've already read it, but no. it's like it, it's pretty much about all the Melbourne streets and it is about junkie. I can't remember the author. Um, H- Helen, H- it's in my room, but I'm not going to go run. To- <laughs> That's okay. We can we can find it. Yeah, cool. So it's about junkies um, in Melbourne. Yeah, monkey grip. Yeah, the Melbourne streets in like the 1970s. Ah, sounds sounds interesting. But like yeah. in Collingwood, in Fitzroy. Yeah. yeah. I found it interesting. Yeah. I think it was cool. Yeah, I found it a good read. So, sorry, what's the what's the genre of this book? Oh, that's a good question. Is it fiction or nonfiction? Yeah, is it fiction or nonfiction? That's fine, my head. <laughs> it is it's nonfiction. It's okay. Nonfiction. Okay. Okay. All right. Um. Lastly, I, yeah, that's pretty much the end of the podcast. But is there anything else you would like to share with our audience? This could be like a plug or anything. Just any way to connect with you. Yeah, well, everyone can connect with me. Um, Charlie Lane Music is my Instagram handle. Um, everything like of mine is up on www.charlielane.com.au. Um, but, yeah, my launch is on, if you're in Melbourne, obviously not you, <laughs> but um, is at the Cactus Lounge on the 15th of November. Um, and, yeah, all merch and stuff is on Bandcamp. But... I think that's that's all the plugging. And oh yeah, my um my album is now on. Um, I'm okay now, but it wasn't until October eighteenth, so this Friday. Sounds good. Well, I'll definitely be listening to the album. Sounds a lot of fun. And I'll come to the launch as well. Um, but thanks so much, Charlie, for coming on the podcast. It was really lovely having you and talking to you about you know your music, your disability, your life in general, and thanks. all the best. Yeah, with your with your launch. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me.